I am the presenter of the Focus program with ABC Radio Perth. It's a delight to be with you today for the Disrupted Festival. The topic we're talking about today, fixing truth, how do we do it and what's stopping us? We will take questions at the end, the final 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how we go as the panel. So if you can keep your questions to the end, there will be roving mics at the end. Fixing truth, yes, well, what tangible actions can arrest the decline of truth in our democracy? Do we require new laws, new journalism models, new ways of thinking, perhaps? What prevents these changes? What prevents us from fixing the lies and misinformation that surround us? In a world of increasing distrust in the media and in politicians, these issues have never been so fundamental to the health of our democracy. Today, I've got three experts with me from across the spectrum of truth to discuss this important topic. Dr. Jeff Gallup, former WA Premier and Emeritus Professor at the University of Sydney, Glyn Greensmith, journalism lecturer at Curtin University and ABC broadcaster, and Narelda Jacobs, newsreader at 10 News Perth. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> truth. We get it drilled into us from a young age, don't we? Tell the truth. Be honest, don't lie or your nose will grow long like Pinocchio. <laughs> Glyn, what does truth mean for you? Jeez. And why does it matter? Thanks, Jessica. Great to be here. What a, what a great festival, what a great panel to be on. Uh, I want to do two very simple things, I think. I want to draw a line from the history of democracy to today, and then I want to kind of break things down into very simple ways, uh, because this is about us, but this is very much about you and, and our engaged and informed democracy, I think. Um, at the very beginning of democratic thought, Socrates was concerned. Here was this new idea, let's, let's let people vote. And Socrates was like, yeah, sure, that seems fine, but if people aren't engaged or informed, isn't giving them the vote a dangerous thing? If, you, if you're about to sail a ship out into a stormy ocean, are you going to vote on who you think is going to be the best person, or are you going to get a captain? And so he was really worried about this idea of democracy seems great, but if an, if an electorate is uninformed, democracy will inevitably, in his view, lead to demagoguery. And as such, the ancient Greeks had a word that I really love, and it's idiotus. And I think we all know what word comes from idiotus, but it doesn't mean to us what it meant to them. Idiotus did not mean you weren't smart. It meant you were not informed in public affairs, rich or poor, high IQ or low IQ, if you were not informed about what was going on around you, you're an idiot and you're a danger to democracy as Socrates saw it. And I think you see that relationship there. Before the word journalism ever existed, you see the relationship between democracy and journalism and that has never changed. It's two and a half thousand years old. Journalism in itself is brand new, but that fundamental relationship has always been there and I think we forget that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who went on to become the President of the United States, not long before he became the US president, said, were I given the choice to live in, in a country without newspapers and a government or a, or a country with newspapers and no government, I would choose newspapers and no government. And he was the US president. He said it's more important that we know what's happening as a population than to have somebody at the top telling us what to do before he became the person at the top telling us what to do. <laughs> So the very nature of democracy relies on an informed electorate, relies on us not having too many idiotas. And so we bring that to today and, and, and we're here talking about truth. What's that got to do with truth? Well, I think that we've lost the elemental relationship between journalism as a gatekeeper of democracy and politics as we see it today. And I think that this is a really good forum and I can't wait to hear what you've all got to, to say about this. To, to play those twos out. So it, when Jess says, what's truth? To me, truth today is a series of metrics. There's a price, we've put a price on truth, not a philosophical price, an actual dollar sign. We judge truth by its value. And what I mean by that is everything you see on TV is determined by ratings. Everything you hear on the radio is determined by ratings. Everything you see in the newspaper is determined by sales. Everything you read online is determined by clicks. Those are metrics, those are numbers that we in the industry use to decide what to tell you and what not to tell you. What do you need to know? This is depressing. What do you want to know? 
who's on Survivor. And that relationship, I think, is problematic. And I think one of the reasons it's problematic is that we've lost the compact, that you understand how we make decisions, you understand those metrics. To me, if you take journalism as a fundamental gatekeeper of democracy, then the metrics we use to define it are inadequate. If everything you see on television is determined by ratings, well then in WA, that's 500 set-top boxes on televisions around this state. And I, that just doesn't cut it for me. Opinion polls, that just doesn't cut it for me. Let's bring Narelda in here. You're a working journalist, yep. and traditionally, we journos have been viewed as the truth tellers, the truth seekers. Yep. But there's increasing levels of distrust in the media. Mm. How do you see that playing out in the day to day? Uh, I think our day in the newsroom starts with meetings between our producers, journos, a chief of staff, uh, and we decide what we're going to cover in the day for starters. Is it worth covering? Um, and I think the, the, the fundamental for every story is, is there a public interest in, in covering the story? Is the public going to benefit? Do they need to hear this? Uh, and a lot of it is do they want to hear it because, Glyn, as you rightly say, we, we need to have people tune in and, uh, and it's, it's sad or, or, or not a fact that a lot of people do choose to look at the fluffy dog stories um, over, you know, sometimes what they need to, what they need to, to, to see and, and to know. And, um, yeah, something that, a good comparison is, uh, at the end of the day, we often put onto social media, our Facebook page and Twitter page, um, stories that we run during the day. And the most clicks, you, you know, you mentioned clickbait, the most clicks do happen for fluffy dog stories. Mm. Yesterday, we ran a story that Lego was opening a store in Perth. That got a lot of clicks. A lot of people were interested in this Lego store. And I see a lot of you going, oh, Lego is going to be open. <laughs> um, but then a story on you know, constitutional change to recognise <laughs> Aboriginal people in the Constitution may not have many clicks. And you might ask yourself, which is the need to know story? So it's a constant balance in the newsroom, but it has to start with that public interest as number one. That is that's the key. What do you need to know? Um, but what we find out there is that what, you're, what you choose to click on is usually not what you need to know, but what you want to know. So that, that's kind of what, uh, mm. what, what you were getting at with that balance. Um, do we I, lead or do we follow? Do we give the people those stories because that's what we think they want, or do we give them to them because that's what they told us they want? Yep. That's yep. a really interesting exactly. question that we always wrestle with editorially in, throughout the whole industry. Do we lead and tell you what you need to know, or do we follow you and you say, no, give us dogs? Mm. So journalists play a role, but we're just one of the gatekeepers, Dr. Jeff Gallup. Run us through the other types that are out there and, and why they're so important in a discussion about truth. Yeah. Thank you very much and, and thanks for the earlier contributions, very thoughtful and insightful. The one thought I'd have about Thomas Jefferson is though that he didn't know about Rupert Murdoch obviously. <laughs> <but> <laughs> I, I think we've entered a, a, a period of time in which what we understood to be the scientific paradigm, uh, it might apply in terms of psychology, it might apply in terms of society, the environment, ecological sciences, psychological sciences, social sciences, which underpinned a lot of the things we did uh, in government and in the community generally. That if you're going to do something, you need to have some basis of research or inquiry that leads you to conclude that, that what you're doing is in fact something that's going to achieve the objectives uh, that you, you want. And so this scientific paradigm built up, it's, it's underpinned all of our major uh, institutions and it's now under real attack. And it's under attack from the, from the point of view of those who say, if I have a belief, I'm under no obligation whatsoever to look at the consequences of the application of that belief, and more so, I'm under no obligations whatsoever to consider other beliefs and the needs and interests perhaps of other people. And so it's a sort of self-enclosed bubble that's created to keep out this world that sends in inconvenient truths mm. or sends in facts that contradict the opinions that, that might be had. And what we've done, and it was, the point was made very well by Glenn, over the years in our democracy, we have various gatekeepers, he used the term. And, and these gatekeepers are there to make sure that when information goes out, uh, it's valid and it's been well researched. There's always an element of doubt about some of the facts that we, we, we talk about. 
we might need new research. So we have the newsroom, we have the editors of newspapers who have a profession called journalism and they try to work out when the news goes out that it's fair and reasonable. We have public servants who in government go to the government and say, that's, a, that's, that's, that's an idea you picked up on Talkback Radio yesterday, but look, we tried it in 1955 and it was no good <laughs> because the evidence tells us that. We have researchers in our universities, our academics, who study things deeply and are able to say, look, it's all very well to say that we need this particular framework of thinking. It might sound good, it might feel good, but it doesn't actually produce the results that you want. Hopefully as well we have political leaders who have the capacity to think up the scale and, and, and when decisions are being made in a cabinet, uh, the decisions are good ones. So let me finish with this image. Imagine a cabinet room. They're sitting around, they're looking at an issue. Who's there? I think we've got, first of all, we've got the ideologues. The ideologues, in a, they know what to do even before the issue gets put on the table. Their ideas are set. They are fundamentalists. Then you've got the people who go, what do the people want? What does the latest opinion poll tell us? That's what we should do. Then you've got the people who are in there working for vested interests. Mm. And, and they're there, usually, perhaps not even openly, but they're there trying to make sure that the interests they support is properly uh, recognised in the final decision. Ideologues, fundamentalists, uh, the opinion pollsters, and then the vested interests. Imagine that that's all that's there. There's no evidence. There's no one else at the table asking the question, if we do X, what will it mean? What do we know about the history of that subject? What do we know about the research that's been done about that subject? Imagine a world where evidence doesn't count. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a very, very dangerous world where there's no verification principles, no checks and balances. So I, I, that's my image of the post-truth, a world without evidence being used to make decisions. Glenn? All of which is politics, for sure, but that's not democracy. And isn't that fascinating? Because what I think has happened, and, 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 it, wasn't one, and it wasn't even Rupert Murdoch, God love him, sat in a room going, let's do it like this. It was kind of a <laughs> gradual thing where the, the idea of journalism as the reporters of what was going on became entwined with politics rather than separated for democracy. And what I mean by that is, you know, every time I speak about politics, I know people are going, oh, I wonder if he votes Labour or Greens or Liberal. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, there is more to democracy than the Republicans and the Democrats and bloody Liberal and Labour. Can we all start with that premise that democracy is more important than the two political parties who happen to have achieved dominance in any one country? And our inability to separate the reporting of politics from the, well, who are you telling me to vote for, is part of the reason that we've allowed this landscape to happen. And a lot of what, what is important about conversations like this is that there has been an implicit relationship between truth and democracy, I think, for two and a half thousand years. But implicit is not getting it done. And we need to take all of those ideas and make them explicit and hammer them and say them out loud. But Narada Jacobs. Yep. There are so many factors now impacting on journalists' ability to actually get to the truth. I think election covering, uh, coverage at election time, and in Australia this last election, raised some really interesting questions. We had fake polls were being run. Um, on the front page. Our, our newsroom didn't, uh, didn't run that fake poll story, and uh, there were a lot of red faces about that. Um, we had opinion polls that suggested a landslide victory that didn't happen. So election coverage, is it, are we going the way of you know, America with this? You know, it's, it, it raises some interesting, interesting questions, like the, the, the very source of news Opinion is now polls questionable. are a thousand people usually, a thousand people's opinion. And we've seen them been, we've seen opinion polls be wrong for years, haven't we? We've seen a catas fairly catastrophic one where, we, where the mechanisms are outdated, therefore we get wrong results. But I don't care what you think about Kevin Rudd or Julia Goddard or Tony Abbott. Do we change prime ministers based on what a thousand people are saying? Is that a fair way to say this is what our democracy should look like? Should we base truth on what 500 people are clicking? Or do we say we demand better metrics in the hope that it gives us better governance, in the hope that it gives us better truth? And, and I just think a thousand people and what they've got to say, it's great to have an indication about what people think and it's so important for people like Jeff, but if it's stopping, I can imagine Jeff being sat in a room 
and saying, oh, this has happened and I've got, I want to go talk about it. And mm -hmm. some hack going, well, you can't say that. It won't poll well. Mm. And the rest of us oh, should be going, well, who cares? Like, look, in a democracy, the people have to be involved. And uh, we, we have their involvement under our current system through their direct action and activity in the community, running campaigns on this issue and that. We have it, of course, through the elections uh, that uh, put our representatives into parliament and then into, into government. But under, underneath democracy, I think, is the concept of the public interest. And Narelda used it when, when she was talking about the, uh, uh, the newsroom in the morning, working out what's in and what's out. The public interest is broader than just the majority interest, as the great John Stuart Mill told us back in the, uh, the 19th century. It's, it's a greater thing. It's something that we need to protect. And it, it's not easy to protect the, uh, the public interest, given these other interests that we have. But there are a couple of things we could do. First of all, I think, when the fake news is, is, has become an issue, and on the surface, it's a great thing to, to, to reflect upon. Unfortunately, it's being used by people who are covering up on the, the real intentions and nature of their own beliefs. They're saying, it's fake news to criticise me because I want to say to four American women that they should go back to where they belong. It's fake news to say that there wasn't a wonderful number of people at a certain presidential uh, uh, inauguration, etc. This is something we really have to tackle. And, and, and because it's, it's spreading into the system, not just spin, we know what spin is. Spin is when people exaggerate uh, their argument, and in a sense, we're always going to have a bit of that in democracy because people will want to argue for what they, they want. Uh, we're always going to have some of that spin, but fake news, I think, is a different matter, and that needs to be addressed. Also, needs to, what needs to be addressed, I think, is the way decisions are made. Uh, deliberation, I think, is a wonderful concept. The idea, the evidence, the consideration, comparing your point of view with someone else. And that's why I've become uh, a strong advocate for citizens' assemblies as a way to conduct deliberation, to try to take away the power from some of the vested interests in our society. So I think there's a lot of issues here. Um, fake news, we really need institutions and policies to take that out because it's polluting our system. Spin, we need more responsibility from our political leaders to talk the truth rather than to spin it around the edges. And I think we need more deliberation in the way that we make decisions. Proper deliberation. And it can happen. It's not as if it's, it, it, it can't be achieved. So politicians, are, I mean, obviously, as I said, trust is uh, dropping in politicians and there's more and more spin. Why do politicians lie? Well, because they're in a very, uh, like, like, it's a very competitive environment. To be the best liar? Sorry? <laughs> to be the best liar? Well, it, it's, it, you know, we've got to understand it's, 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 it's a very competitive situation and, and people find What do you mean by competitive? Do you mean within, be well, between in the politicians? Well, in our representative system of government, winning is everything. I mean, and, and so you've got a culture. I, I say there are a number of diseases that exist in the political realm. One of them is ministerialitis, where ministers <laughs> think they know everything. Another one is departmentalitis, where the ministers do everything that the public service says, rather than take it on the board. But there's another one called electionitis. And when, I'm, I'm amazed at how people lose their sense of rationality in elections. And they do things they shouldn't do. They say things they shouldn't do, mm. because they're so excited by the context. And we've got a, Hillary, uh, that wonderful book on um, uh, the, the book on the Bill Clinton character that became the film, where one of the, the candidates for the president said, we're going to bring everything down and have a proper debate, a proper communication and conversation. I think that's, that's what we need. In the hurly-burly of politics, lots of things are said that shouldn't be said, but people feel they have to because they want to win. When you talk about that competitive environment, it sometimes seems to me on the outside that the two parties have their internal factions drives me crazy listening to them talking about the left faction, the right faction, the Liberal Party. And it seems to me the way that they go about it is that they hate each other more than they hate the other party. That they'd rather lose a, a federal election than have somebody from the other faction of their own party win. So that competitive... Glenn, seems you haven't to... worked it out. The first rule of politics, well, never assume rationality. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honour Jacobs, let's yeah. bring you in here. The, yeah. We were talking about the um, difficulty now for journalists to get to the truth. We know politicians, there's literally 20 spin doctors to every one journalist, I feel at times. Uh, 
There's, what are the other issues though confronting a working journalist? I mean, diminishing resources? Numbers in the um, newsroom. Yeah, mm. numbers in the newsroom is, is the number one factor. Um, when I was out on the road, when, um, Jeff, when you were Premier, that was probably the heyday of, of yeah. my experience in, in a newsroom. We would have like 11 journos on the road. Now we're lucky to have four journos on the road covering you know, in, a, in a, a capital city like Perth. And the same um, uh, numbers are growing now because Channel 10's been bought by CBS, yay, we've got more resources. In fact, we're <laughs> the best placed uh, networker of them all in Australia at the moment. But take um, the Seven West newsroom. Um, they had a whole sweep of redundancies and have lost a, most of their most senior experienced journalists. Um, the ABC is, is suffering as well. Uh, we had nine takeover uh, Fairfax newspapers. There was about 140 or so uh, journos and, and staff that were made redundant uh, Australia-wide. So we, we, we're trying to cover the same amount of news for the same um, geographical areas with fewer people. And so that means that there's less time to investigate stories because we're, we're simply reacting to stories and we're just reacting to the news of the day rather than um, putting a lot of investigative yep. hours into covering the story. So a lot of the time it's just journalists' instincts on the ground and unfortunately they're, they're not as experienced as they probably were but they're very enthusiastic and they've got loads of confidence uh, and good training from what they get from um, uh, Glyn and, and the like so we just have to put faith in that the journals really, have got. Glyn, what about, what about um, media ownership though? Oh, um, yes. A concentration of media ownership is yep. another huge factor here. It is. I mean in Perth we see it, we all see it uh, and the truth coming out there, there's a lot of uh, advertising revenue at stake yes. Isn't there? Never the underestimate the power of just two people in a room. That's pretty much how every decision we take for granted has been made. And it really surprises me how often we take these things for granted. And, and media ownership was not designed like this. So even back in the 30s, the Australian government was like, oh, what is journalism? How should we regulate it? And they were like, well, if one person owns everything, that's not journalism. It took people to change that. It took Rupert Murdoch sitting down with Malcolm Fraser, then Rupert Murdoch sitting down with Bob Hawke, because all the best bastardry is bipartisan, uh, and changing the laws. Oh, and then they changed them again really recently. Now, these were human beings making a decision in a room to undo the thing that was there because it was thought to be the best thing. And we've all just gone, yeah, okay. We're not going to vote on that. I know you're not going to vote on that. But it's really important when Narelda says, you know, the ABC has been in trouble. That's because somebody decided the ABC needs to be in trouble. I'm in charge and I'm going to take your money away and you're in trouble. Channel 10 is doing better because someone decided to buy it. Which brings us to another simple metric. How do we pay for this? And I, all I want to say is if we've decided that it's a gatekeeper of democracy and democracy is in trouble, can we refund journalism? so that Narelda's got 11 journalists on the road feeding her bulletin in different ways than how much we charge you for the adverts based on 500 people clicking a remote control. Is it not unreasonable to say that that metric is a little bit out of date and we can try different ways to, to fund mm. a, a diverse and interesting media environment? We're going to get into some of the solutions mm -hmm. to some of these issues towards the end, but we've touched on the media's obsession with clicks and mm. in uh, the cat video. It's always more popular than a, a story about corruption uh, in politics, unfortunately. And we push what's popular over what might be in the public interest, okay? What about the role of social media in the decline of truth, Jeff? That is... Well, I was, when I was listening to Glenn, he was saying, you know, someone makes this happen. Uh, and, and of course, there are people who make decisions that undermine uh, the public interest. But th there is a technology issue here as well, a communications mm -hmm. technology issue where it's so easy now for people to, to say things, to join up with other people online, form their little groups without any questioning. There's, 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 no, there's no gatekeepers there. And of course, the big challenge is to try and get some, and that's, that's mm. the debate we're having at the moment. But I think technology is a player in this. The very fact that anyone can say anything pretty well online, uh, evil people have worked out that they can try and use it to influence elections as well. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it is a technology that's also offered unbelievable opportunity to people. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of, when I, I think of the world, I always see contradictions. There's, there's always contradictions. There's never a perfect resolution of anything. And technology's been a wonderfully good thing, but it's also carried these risks attached to it. And, and so I'm not quite with Glenn when he says it's someone's made this decision to make this happen. 
Diversity of the media is needed. We don't want concentration, that's true. But there is another dynamic at work here, I think. The internet is very one. young, mm. and like a lot of young people, just needs a good lie down sometimes. <laughs> um, bit of a bex. A bit, yeah, just a little, little nap time for the internet, I think. We've all, we can all decide that the great promise of the human encyclopedia has turned into people shouting at each other. But still, it is people making decisions. And one of the great things I think we, 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 the trap we shouldn't fall into is that the internet is just this amorphous monster that cannot be contained. The Kraken is loose. That is, I just don't think that's true. I think it's unconstrained because we haven't asked yet. And now that we're seeing people ask, we're seeing it in New Zealand, our prime minister here has said, what can we do? That is the first step to trying to rein that in. But it's amazing how little, how often we just refuse to ask the question because we kind of think, well, that's just it now. Social media allows people to live in a bubble. Mm. Uh, we, you know, we have, a world of information at our fingertips, but we choose to only read and click on what we want to yeah. read and click on. And um, Israel Folau seems to me to be a prime example with his uh, Twitter comments um, and social media comments and the, and the people that, that follow him. Uh, and if you are a supporter of Israel Folau, then perhaps the algorithms mm. um, will only allow you to see things you know that support his views. And so you may end up thinking that that is the only view. And that's the danger, um, mm. because it allows us to live in the bubble that we want to live in, rather than accessing you know, the, a news bulletin that will show you what other people are saying about Israel Folau um, mm. and perhaps you know, challenge your, your thinking. Mm. So uh, social media in that context is really dangerous. Mm. Um, we had a situation, did, did any, anybody see the Adam Goods documentary, um, The Final Quarter? Fantastic, wasn't it? Um, I, I thought it was a must-see for all Australians and it made me mm. really passionate and, you know, were, I was angry and, you know, it was e e emotive and all of the things, you know. Um, and it just made me feel so proud of Adam Goods and all of those people that stood up with him. Most of the comments that 10 Daily, Channel 10's um, website got, were people who slammed the documentary, slammed yeah. Adam Goods. And most of those didn't watch the documentary. <laughs> You know, so, so yeah. people are reading these comments thinking that's what most people think. So I'm not alone, mm -hmm. you know, but so that, that's why social media in that context is so dangerous. And, and Jeff, that, that goes into the point about this post-truth yes. era. We're seeing this rise of abuse and hate speech mm. by the well, uninformed. I think, informed. I think we've discussed, you know, the technology, uh, 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 we've discussed the nature of uh, fake news and post-truth and how it operates at, at the level. But I think we've got to take the discussion up a little bit as well. There are a lot of politics in all of this. And, and, and the, as I see it, uh, not having that evidence person at the cabinet table and not taking into account you know, the best thinking on an issue, slamming experts and all that, is reflective of uh, a great challenge that's going on in our society at the moment. I think uh, we, 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 we defeated the fascist menace back in 1945. Uh, communism eventually collapsed in, in the late 1980s. We thought it was all going to be great. You know, there'd be a perfect world would result, a democracy would spread, uh, the third world would get the chance to trade more freely with the, uh, the advanced industrial democracies, and everything would turn out okay. Then all of a sudden, there's been this massive assault on progress. It's a reactionary position. If you think about all of the values that we hold and the way that we look at things, uh, that, that, that science matters, uh, and science tells us something about climate change. Some vested interests don't like that idea. We've seen women get more equality in our society. Sexism uh, has been uh, tackled. We've got uh, the rights of uh, gay and lesbian people have been given uh, uh, proper recognition in, in many communities. Uh, we see people of a non-English speaking background in our own country given certain rights under the framework of multiculturalism. Uh, we've seen more trade between different countries uh, as a result of uh, some of the international developments that occurred. And, and, and some people don't like this, either for vested interest reasons or ideological reasons, and they've worked out that in order to pursue their politics, they've got to undermine science. They have to undermine uh, the values that, that our society has because those, that society has created the idea of equality, has created the idea that we can work better as a, as a community together. So post-truth actually is a paradigm for a whole group of right-wing populist types who are making a head-on assault against our modern society. And, and I think this is playing itself out 
uh, in many parts of the world currently. Uh, and and it, it's, it's a most, I think it's, it's a real, really negative development in our human history because there's no reconciliation between those two sides. I mean, if you don't believe in scientific methodology, if you don't believe in uh, human rights, rather if you might believe in religious rights or social rights, but not human rights, it's very, very hard to get a dialogue with those that do. We and have, and, 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 and as, as a certain president says, there are winners and there are losers, mm. and I intend to be a winner. And, and he's a great example of, of he's, he's demanding that politics define your truth when what we should have is truth defining your, your politics. And, and Jess used a great word a second ago that I really think ties into what you two are both saying when you talked about ill-informed and misinformed and yep. the empowerment That's of right. ignorance that we've seen through our politics because they're saying you be as ignorant as you want as long as your ignorance gets a tick in my box, I'm happy. And I think we again have lost that compact of saying that being informed is an act of civic duty. I think it, it, you're more patriotic if you're informed. I don't give, couldn't care less who you vote for. If you are informed, you're more patriotic than somebody who you know, gets a, a tattoo of a flag. And, and I think we've lost that. And, and the idiotis kind of tells us that, that it was never designed to be elitist. And we hear that word thrown out at us a lot. And I want to come, come just, just point to a, this bubble idea is so true. I'm fairly sure, and I'll only say this because I don't think he's listening because he lives in Northern England. I'm fairly sure my old man voted for Brexit. And he was out here at Christmas and we, we had the argument. Uh, he's northern working class and he's very like Trump's constituency. Smart, engaged man, my father. But, and I didn't say for or against Brexit. I said, well, let's just look at the evidence. And he said, well, I reject that evidence. And I said, well, what about the lies? And he said, well, they all lie. They both are as bad as each other. And I was like, well, were they? And, and it was a really interesting conversation for me because you know, we are, this idea of the bubble and, and, and often when you are presenting evidence, the, the very last thing people fall back on is, oh, you're just elitist. And it's like, oh, mate, that's such a hard thing to argue against. When I'm just saying, I'm trying to get these bits of information, not for or against. And, we, and journalism, I think, has very much lost that ability to engage with those people, whereas politics, bad politicians, has done a very good job mm. of engaging with those people. Now, we don't want you to all go home depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I at mean, the pub the after The world this. is Come depressing enough. Let's create some hope. Let's look at what we as a community can do to help arrest this decline in truth and, I suppose, restore some faith in mm. our politicians and in we the media. So we touched on the fact that the journalism business model doesn't seem to be working. Click, 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 cat video, cat video, cat video. I'm over it, are you? Okay, it needs a major service. What needs to happen, Glyn? There are great ideas all over the world right now about different ways we fund it. It starts with the simplest premise of all, uh, you know, Lots of people really understand the importance of journalism in, in a democracy. Really, really bad people understand the importance of journalism in a democracy. So we need to take it back <laughs> and demand that we actually have different ways of funding it. There are hundreds of different ideas out there. And I've just come back from a, a journalism education conference in Paris, whatever, no big deal. Um, just drop that in. And it was just, it's just so great to see people having those ideas. The first thing I want to do is just say this, the fourth estate model, you've all heard this term, I don't know how familiar you are with it. It's an old term, but I'll give you a sort of the new version. The first estate is government. The second estate is powerful institutions, which used to be religion, but probably still is, and you can put your big businesses in there. The third estate is the people. The fourth estate is journalism. And our job is to represent all of them to each other. Well, right now, we are controlled by governments and business. Well, let's just not. I, I don't want the Prime Minister of the day deciding what the ABC funding is. He's got no business, she's got no business. No business deciding ABC funding, take it out. It's really not that hard when you try. When we have, and um, people can and should make money in a commercial environment, but the worth of journalism is more than the dollar sign, can we, once we evolve that understanding, there are readily available ideas that aren't that complicated. It's, you know, the worth of your home is not the value of it on the market. It's your home. Journalism is a bit like that. And so what I would say is without going into any of them specifically, uh, and I was just um, over in Europe and we were looking at some of the different funding models in Germany. They just have like a, like a direct debit that comes out of everyone's account, 20 euros a month, thank you very much, to pay for journalism. And some people hate it and a lot of people just go, well, that's, yeah. we, we want a robust media environment. We understand that relationship. We're okay with that. There are lots of funding models. It's that 
starting, we, I'm half Irish, and we have a saying in Ireland that I think people think is a joke, but it's actually quite profound. In Ireland, they say, hey, Glyn, what's the way to Greencastle? They say, sure, it's easy to get to Greencastle. You just don't want to start from here. <laughs> and that's what's happened with journalism and democracy. Not all journalists are well behaved, though. Not all media organisers are well behaved. And, uh, you know, do we need to perhaps look at um, some sort of a better professional standards, independent oversight of journalism? You know, lawyers have the legal practice board. Uh, doctors have the medical board. Norelda, mm. do you mm. think that we need to restore faith by actually having checks and balances on us? I think it's important to label um, media outlets as tabloid journalism or journalism you can trust. Public um, interest journalism. Yes, because there are... There's a mix up there, isn't there, at the there moment? there are newspapers that are heading towards tabloid journalism and you can just kind of see the amount of photos and gossipy photos that are suddenly appearing on front pages of like newspapers that are very close to home. Um, <laughs> and you know, you, you kind of need to ask yourself, do I, you know, what direction is this paper heading, you know? Um, so I think, I think that's really important that we identify sources that we can continue to trust. And I would like to think our newsroom is one of those sources, the ABC is one of those sources, but there's got to be no political interference in the ABC. And I think that's, um, that's really important as well. But is part of the problem though that the public do tend to lump all of us in together? So mm. if we had a pr more the professional media. standards, I mean, would you like to see more professionalism brought into journalism? You, you know, you've had the media cover you for many years, Jeff, mm. when you were the, the Premier. Mm. Do you think uh, that there's room for improvement there in terms of higher standards uh, and independent oversight? Well, well, I think the concept of higher standards is something that we really should apply through all of our uh, major institutions. Uh, clearly, in the media, it's great to see the journalists standing up for standards when you know, there's a lot of pressure on them to dilute those standards and, indeed, to act not like journalists but, but, but as like politicians. Uh, I think political uh, leaders need to set higher standards in terms of the way that they're looking at issues and the seriousness with, with which they're addressing them. Uh, and, and you can take that idea of professionalism right through uh, our major institutions, our universities. It's uh, very, very important that they, um, they engage in, in careful research and they don't uh, you know, gild the lily in terms of some of the findings because they might want to emphasise too much what, what they've found. But I think that's one level. The other level, of course, is we need uh, better policies and, and, and a legal framework for uh, these issues. Uh, you know, there's a big debate going on with Facebook and the other me uh, platforms about how they check up on fake news and whether or not they can be taken off before it's too seriously uh, damaging through the community. There are codes of conduct uh, that, that we can look at that. But I think there's another issue here that, uh, that I'm very interested in these days, and that is I've presented to you a story where there's a sort of a war going on between two ways of thinking and two sorts of politics. And war is no good. I mean, obviously, uh, living in a society where there's conflict at that level is not good. Because at some point, it'll burst out into real conflict of the physical sort where, where violence is, is involved. And you, and you can see the division in America at the moment. And with their gun uh, policies, of course, it's, it's dangerous. Um, I think the people, quote unquote, uh, the, the people that Glenn mentioned that, that our good friend Plato used to talk about and whatever, they do feel as though, you know, they've been left out. Now, the idea of just letting their, all of the things they believe take over society without any checking, I think, is, is, is a bad prospect. But I think we have to find some way to bring those people back into the tent of what I would call the Enlightenment way of thinking about things. Uh, the better sort of society, the more free society, less hate, uh, you know, less, less social division that's not based upon, you know, merit or whatever, but it's a, it's a hierarchical concept. Uh, you know, uh, fundamentalism and the impact it can have on society. We've got to bring people back in. And I think elections aren't enough. And so opinion polls are not the way to go. But we can get people back into the system, and it's happening all over the world, particularly at local level and at state level, not so much at the international level with the exception of Ireland, Glyn's uh, one of his parents' homeland, um, where they've had these citizens' assemblies to consider mm. issues. Very, very positive way to bring people back in 
get them thinking through issues, getting their confidence. And it's the sort of political, uh, it's the political equivalent of what you can see when some people go out on a, on a, on a uh, what we might call a fundamentalist surge and they become totally convinced of the truth of their own ideas. They don't see other people as people. They start to see them as categories. And, and, you, and you can read the stories, and there's a wonderful one publicised in the New Yorker recently about that group in America, the Baptist church people, who've got this very extreme view that America's being punished because of its... Lord Louis Thoreau did a program on it. Mm. America's being punished because of its... Uh, support for gay and lesbian people. Oh, the Westboro Baptist, uh, Westboro Baptist Church. Baptist. One nice. of the family has come over to the other side. Now, how did that happen? Di she was having dialogue on the internet with someone. The ideas were putting forward. They started to talk. She started to think to herself, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not recognising other people. I'm treating them like categories. I'm treating them like enemies. And slowly but surely, she came around. That's the image I have of what we need to do in our political system. Bring people back in start to get them in the mode of thinking where the hate goes and the prejudice goes and they start to see uh, you know, that, that, that there is a better way uh, to live. So I'd say the three levels, professional standards through everything, some good policies to deal with the fake news and uh, problem, and then thirdly, some good institutions that bring deliberation to the table. Well, hopefully the good policies will come um, with the, you touched on the Facebook well, they should and do, Google. Yeah. Um, the report just came out on, on Friday and um, so uh, I think we could hopefully have a bit of faith that the recommendations of that report will, um, will, will, will burst the bubble because, you know, how many times have we, um, you know, when, when, when we started to have these pop-up ads on our, you know, Facebook feed or, you know, any Google search that we did, um, when we, you know, looked on a, to, to book a, a hotel or whatever, and then all of a sudden we got bombarded mm. with all of the places in Bali that we were suddenly, you know, looking mm. at going, how, well, how did they know that? Well, now it's like, you know, you, you, you spend something on, your, you pay for something on your credit card, and all of a sudden the very place that you've gone shopping appears on your feed. And it's like, well, that's really creepy. How do mm. they know that? So that's exactly what the report that was handed down um, mm. during uh, last week. Uh, this is the ACCC report, the um, consumer watchdog. Yeah, so now it's in the federal government's hands to do what they will with it, and hopefully, you know, we're going to um, hold Google and Facebook to account and burst that bubble. Well, at least we're going to start to, and I we're think it's start start, it can take mm. a while, and, and the importance of having forums like this and conversations like this is that you normalise the conversation, and, and having been part of other sort of areas, it can take four years, it can take five years. The idea is to try and make an inevitability towards something more positive. Jess's idea is really interesting. I, I do this with, with my students. Should there be an equivalent of the bar for journalism to help us with what Narelda was saying, separate the journalist as a noble gatekeeper of democracy from the muckraker, from the, from the bin chaser, the ambulance chaser, it is, is a fascinating one because regulation is controlled by governments. We don't trust governments. That's a problem. Yet, once you put it in that higher standard, do we get better journalism? Do we get better democracy? Or do we then become more elitist? Uh, you know, the news director of the ABC here in WA doesn't have a formal journalism qualification, but is easily one of the smartest and most decent humans I know. And I, I love that about journalism as opposed to, you know, I don't think politics has any place for me. I don't think they would want me. I don't think I have the right surname or background or connections, whereas that journalism- That you be successful, you <laughs> Well, I think we take all comers. We don't care how rich you are or where you lived or who you sleep with. We'll take you all. And there's not many things that you can do in modern society now where you can make an impact and, and be like that. So I love that about our industry, and I don't want to lose that either. It's such a great question. What about the political realm? We've just talked about the problem of more lies seem to be told during elections now, because you can get away with it, and the problems with opinion polls. We're obsessed with them in the media, mm. unfortunately. Short of outlawing spin doctors, <laughs> how do we restore truth from our politicians? Jeff? Well, I've sort of hinted at a few sort of institutional uh, uh, issues. I, I think it's how do people look at it? Look at an issue. I mean, those who who debate post truth and all of the things that are happening in the political context, including the politicians, see it as a battle that's going on. And, and you know, it, it, it's sort of one side, the other side. It's the normal political thing. I guess that the step that has to be taken, I think, which is an important one that I, I believe 
is the case, that this is a very retrograde development. I, I don't think any good can come out of this. We're drifting. We're drifting. And, and, and a drift doesn't, you know, once you start institutionalising bad habits, mm -hmm. you know, it's very, very hard to turn back again. And, and so I guess how do we get politicians more concerned about this? I think, is, I think they've got to take more seriously some of the, 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 the big issues that are being posed by this drift to post-truth. Let me give you one example. And Glyn talked about his dad, you know, and, and the Brexit. There's a wonderful paper in the new, the, the London Review of Books a couple of weeks ago by an English liberal conservative, Ferdinand Mount, talking about the history of Europe and how it came together as a union. And he talks about the wars that occurred, of course, the First and the Second World War, the battle over resources, partly a battle over resources, and, and how the first thing they did in Europe after the Second World War is, is to create the, the policies about coal, that they could better manage the resource in Europe so that people wouldn't want to go to war. And, and he points out that those that are, that are now going for the Brexit are really, they're unthinking. They think the world's simple. There's no detail to their thinking. Uh, and and I, I guess unless you believe that this is a very retrograde development that's occurring and you've got to do something about it as a politician, uh, you, you're not going to take up the challenge. So I think we've got to start thinking this is a very serious development. This is very serious. We're drifting and, and the conflict that will come out at the other end will be, will, will, and it will happen at some point, it will happen. You know, trade wars, they always finish up in this sort of conflict. I think we should have a bar for politicians. <laughs> at pre-selection pre time. Um, yes. I mean, in WA, Barry Irvin comes to mind. Mm. Um, so just for everyone who forgot, this was uh, yeah. a, a Labor MP who lied on no. his CV and no. uh, wore fake a, medals. Yeah. Fake, fake medals. Just for context. And, so, and it was because the checks and balances weren't put in place mm. for, ahead of his pre-selection. They just took it on face value that, yes, all of these uh, credentials were, um, were factual. In, in fact, he, yeah. he had just lied. Uh, he had lied about yeah. them. Um, so I think there needs to be... We need to have more respect for politicians at pre-selection time. Yes. Well, what about what about the idea of longer terms of government? Because you've already said, Jeff, earlier in the day, well, the focus is on winning, mm. winning, winning, Constant winning. The election next election, election, the next yeah. election. So, would longer terms help help the debate around you know fixing truth? I, I, I look. I think there should be four-year terms national, interna at our national level. I think it's silly that we've got the three, I agree, but I'm not sure that's the grand solution. I, I think there are... The, is it a good first step? Well, it, it's, it's a step I support, but I'm not sure it's going to tackle post-truth. Uh, I think it's, it's the degree of competition in the election that's going to determine the degree of misinformation that goes out and, 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 and the professionalism of the people involved. Uh, and also the laws that require bringing accountability, you know, the sort of thing we're discussing over in New South Wales at the moment. There's a discussion over lobbying, how it works, how it should be properly regulated, etc. So I think, uh, you, you know, I think we need to do all of those sorts of things to try to, uh, to get the system working better. I thought Narelda's point was, was excellent, that idea of, you know, we have the, the post-truth as a philosophical concept that seems really hard and far away, but we also have your electorate Who's your representative and how did they choose them? That's something you can impact, especially if you're a member, if you're a Liberal Party member, who are they choosing and why? Uh, a, a fundamental question for students of journalism that I like to pose is ask every, when you see anything, who decides and how do they decide? Mm. Now that is a question we all as a society should be asking. And you think about the factionalism I was talking about and all of those checks and balances. If you're in an electorate and you're a member of the Labour Party, who are you picking and how are you picking them? is such a great question in order for us to get better politicians, which actually inevitably leads to better democracy. But we're not doing that. There's so much information overload these days, isn't there? I don't know about you, but sometimes my brain yeah. feels like it's going to explode. Uh, and We do need cat videos every <laughs> now and then. I mean, fair. <laughs> not too many on the ABC yet. Um, but the, you know, the, the public do play a huge role in this uh, fixing of truth and choosing what you give your attention to, thinking criti critically, being discerning about what you consume mm. in terms of the media. How do we get the public on board? How do we get you on board, Jeff? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I, I think it's, it, we, we talk about the distrust that people have towards governments. And as I sort of was 
implying in my earlier comments about deliberative democracy, there's a bit of distrust politicians and the people. And, and, and you both feed off each other to create a, a, a negative dynamic. Uh, I think uh, politicians, you, you know, we, ha we have to trust people because, you know, that's what it is. I mean, that's the community. That's the whole point of democracy. But we've got to, at the same time, have the gatekeepers that we talked about earlier, and we've also got to have the institutions where, where people get the chance to show the better sides of their nature. I mean, you think about it, uh, and I think others was, were mentioning, if you have a, a, an opinion pulse to stick a microphone in someone's and say, you know, what do you think about this, and bang, out it comes. It's not real consideration. <laughs> so I think we need institutions that allow for deliberation. Parliament was supposed to be that, but Glyn hit the nail on the head. Inevitably, Parliament was going to be factionalised and, and the parties were going to come in, inevitably. And, and you know, there's checks and balances there that are, that are good ones. But it's, elections aren't enough. They're not enough to get people back onto the team of democracy, freedom, tolerance, a better society. We've, we've got to get them back. And, and I think uh, deliberation and, and institutions like what the Irish have done is one way of doing that. Nerelda? Support your trusted news service by watching, <laughs> by reading, by listening. Good, good. And if you are reading and watching and listening to something that you think is tabloid journalism, that is fake news, that is giving oxygen to things that are um, misleading, then let that news service know. You know, write to them, phone them, um, give them instant feedback because that's the only way that they're going to know that um, the trust is being eroded. Mm. But what's what's more important is to is to support your trusted news service. Mm. To be there are some activist groups actually now that target the advertisers of platforms that do allow fake news. They there are lots of things citizens can do actually yeah. to impact the to financial promote. flow, impact the ratings. Mm. I, I would put it really simply: to be idiotus is an Australian. Like we've seen that phrase on Australian used for all sorts of nefarious aims. Can we, I would... can we get a car sticker for that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the back isn't of the it, car bumper sticker? Isn't it a simple sticker, thing to think? say to be informed in a democracy is an act of civic duty? You're a patriot. Not who you vote for, but to be informed mm. and to be engaged in your democracy is an act of patriotism. We've lost control of that phrase to the scoundrels. Take it back. When the raids happened recently, the federal police raids on the ABC headquarters in Sydney and also on the News Limited journalists where they mm. were going through even her underwear drawer, mm -hmm. sadly, but true. Um, we have a US president as well who says things like journalists are the enemy of the people. How do we rein in attacks on the media? Is there a way to call that out? Uh, well, is there anything more we can do than just call it out? It seems to me when uh, the raids on the uh, ABC happened, the talk back I was getting and texts to the ABC line, well, they deserved it. Yep. They didn't have the right to share that information. People did not care. And I think that that information was so in the public interest. Uh, how do we correct what, that? What is public interest? The, these, these ideas of subjectivity, what is journalism? What is it for? What is public interest? We've lost that because it's been implicit for too long. Make it explicit. This is who we are and what we do, and this is why it impacts you. To be fair, it shouldn't have to impact you directly for you to care, by the way, but it actually does. Did you see Robert Mueller's testimony in the US at Congress this week? Six hours, where he reiterated, and a foreign government attacked an election. The President of the United States probably committed obstruction of justice, definitely told other people to, and he couldn't be indicted because they decided that there wasn't a legal precedent to indict him, but could be indicted when he stood down. That's a pretty damning indictment of a sitting president in what is still the most powerful democracy on earth. And as I do, because I'm a sad, lonely man, I, I watched all the feedback on cable television in the United States, the reaction to it. You know what the reaction was? Oh, it didn't rate well. He was quite dull, wasn't he, this person who followed legal norms in order to do something really important? Yeah, but where was the pizzazz? And that was the conversation, and you realise suddenly we are having entirely the wrong conversation about something absolute, I mean, as critical as an attack on democracy by a foreign government. It's like, yeah, but, you know, would Taylor Swift have done a better job? Undoubtedly, yes. Jeff, we don't, we don't have a lot of time left before we're going to take your questions. So hopefully you've got some coming to mind. Get ready, the roving mics will be coming around. Um, but we, we could look at legal changes here, legislative changes, but you're not a huge fan of moving down that way. You prefer the idea of promoting something, the idea around 
You know, a Buddhist idea was what, something you mentioned to me. Can oh, we have a I chat think, about that? I love that well, idea. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in you know, Buddhist concepts and, and, and how they relate to the individual within the community. And, and one of them is right speech. And it's interesting that we don't, we don't talk much about what is right speech. Occasionally it comes up if there's a defamation case or something that someone's uh, posing or, or it's, it's an extreme comment by a politician. But you, you, we, we need to encourage this. And that is you know, not to spread information and lies, uh, to not slander people, uh, to listen to what other people are saying as part of the process as well, to listen more carefully at what they're saying, uh, to not abuse them. Uh, to not be trivial and spread gossip just for the sake of it, which can get out of hand. This idea of speaking properly as a human being within the society, recognising that there are other people, uh, it fits in with my idea too to have more de de deliberation in our system of government. And I I've got this little mad idea. It would be it would be nice to to have a little monitor group, you know, that when when people give speeches, to to, to look at the speech and say, you know, to what extent was that according with the Buddhist principles of right speech. And, you know, how often they don't. How often they don't. Now, if you want to reduce the amount of hate in society, obviously you've got to reduce the amount of hateful speech. But you have to recognise that it's hateful. And I think one of the issues we have today is the freedom of speech movement, quote unquote, which it's very hard to, to argue against freedom of speech. But don't be under any illusions that a lot of those people defending freedom of speech, what they're actually defending is hate speech. And, and, and I think that this, that we're losing this, this sense of what it means to speak properly. And, and so I think having a little monitor where we check up and point out whether or not uh, uh, people are engaging in right speech or wrong speech would be a useful addition uh, along with the fact check, fact checking is very important as well, along with that. Narelda, that would appeal to you, the yeah. idea that yeah. we, rather than get the, the big stick out, maybe a carrot and we promote as a society, because this yeah. is all about the community mm. exactly. getting involved. This is about you yeah. taking some responsibility and us to promote the idea of a society where right, right speech becomes the norm. Yes, we all need to be, a, we all need to have a bit of a journalist in us. When We all need to be a gatekeeper. Uh, how many times have we shared information by saying, "Oh, I read, I read, you know, such and such," or you know, oh, "I saw the, the other day, last night on the news, I, I watched this," and you're sharing it in good faith that it is true. You don't want to share something that is exactly not true, mm. you know. So that's why you need to get your news from a trusted source, um, because you know, I, you know, my. So many times I'm out and about and my family or friends will go, oh, yeah, I saw, it on the, saw, saw this on the news last night. And I can be very proud that I know what you have heard is the truth. Mm. Um, but we can't say that about everything that we read. And so that's why we need to have that bit of a gatekeeper and, and be suspicious. We need to read things with, with a suspicious mind. Glenn? During the Second World War, George Orwell said that if I heard it on the radio, it means it was true. Mm. That was like the pub conversation. Oh, where did you hear that? I heard it on the radio. Yeah. That was a, a catchword for truth. I'm well, not sure that applies today, but I would love that to apply. You didn't say that I saw it on the news. You yeah. know, so if you see it on the news, it must be true. And understanding that difference between public interest journalism and a news. Mm. So that the, 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 the entire bracket of what news is is ridiculous and quite harmful. And, and what you were saying before about that separation of what is public interest journalism in the interests of democracy, as opposed to Here's who somebody is sleeping with somewhere, or here's a, 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 you know, a seal that makes great fart noises. I would click on that, but I would go back to economic reports afterwards. So just understanding those differences is, is really crucial. And that's a really easy thing to say and a hard thing to enact, that idea of we as a society, isn't it? Because this is all individual people and we think, well, how do we do that? I think that's really interesting. What is that self-regulation that we take on ourselves, and, and how do we start that? I, I had a... Um, I was, I was in, um, in Europe and I was they, in Amsterdam they all ride bicycles. This is, sounds weird, I know, but bear with me. And it's so neat and it's, there's no rules about the bicycles and where they're parked. You all know the Amsterdam, you know. The, mm. But they clearly decided as a society that they would self-regulate how they're going to park their bikes because they love their town. And I looked at that and I thought, that's really interesting that they clearly made that decision. And when you bring it back to Perth, I had a, a, an interesting revelation. Can we not merge because we assume other people can't merge? Is that what's stopping us? If we just assumed we all could merge, could we merge? 
<laughs> All right, that's one. enough. Like that's it. enough from us. I actually agree we're that. being silly now and we're getting into a bubble. We're going to get outside the bubble and we're going to hear from you, the most important people here today. Uh, we've got uh, roving mics around. Plenty of questions. Yep, flip your arm up. That's right. And we'll be coming around. So we're going to go... Let's go... Where's, I'm try, just trying to see where the mic is. What's going to be easy mic for you? Mic over there. All right. Oh, there's a couple of gentlemen in the middle here. So there's a man here with a grey jumper on. Yep, that's it. Wave it. We've got you there, sir. It's coming through. That's it. Be community-minded. Pass it down. Well. Thank you. Can Give you us your name me? if that's OK, sir. Hello. Yes. For the panel, but specifically perhaps for Glenn. Politics. Yes. If uh, the CSIRO can assist and help with development in Australia, yes. Can political scientists help and influence the politicians? Uh, to go back to Jeff's point earlier, the, the simple answer there is we've really lost our relationship with evidence, haven't we? Um, and if we have an evidence-based policy making, like we attempt in, in journalism to have evidence-based journalism, and we understood those things, uh, then, then that relationship, I think, is much stronger about what we're seeing come out and why it's coming out. And so we re-establish that element of trust. We clearly don't have that. We have vested interests and ideology far more prominent than evidence-based policy making. So I would welcome all sorts of ways that that could happen. Down the front here, lady in the front, we'll just wait for the mic and if, maybe just give us your name. We're promoting being part of Community Day today. Left. Here you go. Uh, Marie Zudwin, I don't trust the media and I don't trust the government um, at all because I think it's... <laughs> that was the first round of applause today, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm getting teary now. <laughs> Mainly because I think they're heavily influenced by vested interests. And the vested uh, interests for putting pressure on journalists what to say in the media. Which is so what you we're don't saying. trust all the. Right. So are you saying but you don't trust all media, or do you have trusted sources that you do rely on? I, I don't know who to believe anymore. Even Google is being influenced by. Even uh, Google. You know what the pages? If you if you type in something, you know there's page after page on one particular side of a particular opinion, but not the other side. So the, there's no balance of opinion anymore. In so, the media. So it's For almost instance, like it, pharmaceutical companies have got a major influence on the media and the government. So they're influencing what is... Rupert Murdoch is on the, um, uh, on, on the, on the board of Merck, so he's influencing especially on what the media says about pharmaceutical drugs, yes. drugs and vaccines especially. So I don't trust what the media says because they're heavily biased on one side and you don't hear the other side. Okay, so, so that's more of a statement. I can only argue for the ABC. I think that we are... I think that the ABC can be... Is, is, the, is the most trusted news source in Australia right at this moment. And mm. I can, I can, I've worked at other news... <laughs> and I don't just say that because they pay my wage. I've worked at numerous other news sources and I do say that uh, with my hand on my heart. And I'm really sad to hear that you don't trust the media and that's why we're here today. Uh, Commercial and public broadcaster, though, can I just say some of the greatest journalists and greatest journalism in history is happening right now. I think the difference is we're not accessing it. Yes. We're not reading it, watching it or listening to it, and that's across commercial and public. There is phenomenal journalists and journalism happening out there. The difference is where do we lose connection with them? Thanks for your input, though. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm gonna, I might just go... At the beginning, the blue jumper. Questions. Blue, yep, yeah, this lady here, blue jumper. Oh, thank you, um, Chris here. Um, for the panel, um, you spoke about uh, people becoming involved in what's being spoken about, whether it's the... Um, migrant situation or it's about the weather or anything else. We are seeing a lot of young people in particular taking issues on the young schoolgirl um, who was talking against uh, the Greta weather Thunberg. situation. Mm. Yeah. And they seem to be the group that are taking things on board and pushing back. Would you agree with that? And do you think that that gives um, us as a democracy or as a government hope that things will work themselves out in the future? Jeff, I think that's one for I you. Think, I think it is very, very interesting to look at some of the big uh, votes that have been held in countries like ours and ours in recent times, the difference emerging between the, the young yeah. cohort and the older cohort, and uh, with different values. And look at the Brexit vote in the UK. It was an incredible distinction mm. between the older and the younger. Uh, 
Uh, look, I, I, I'm very much of the view now that we ought to be allowing uh, people aged between 16 and 18 to enrol, uh, should they wish, at 18 I think they have to enrol, uh, to get more young people onto the voting roll I think now is an important uh, part of decision making because young people are showing signs of uncertainty and the, the, you know, I, I made this point on the, four, on the Q&A this week, they're miners canaries, they're picking up on things mm. and we need them more into the decision making system. So I'd lower the voting age. I teach young people for a living, they give me <laughs> tremendous hope. They're, they are excellent. It should all be a little bit easier on young people than you are. Uh, baby boomers are the biggest sharers of fake news, you know, so we, we're a bit hard on young people. They give me a lot of hope when, when I teach them. They really want to tell the truth and they want to do good. Man with the mic. You've got the mic, you're, you're, you've uh, got the hey, floor. <laughs> hey John, um, you're talking about standards. How about increasing integrity by declaring one's interests or conflict of interest for that matter? You know, if you take a particular position or you're representing a particular interest, declaring that from the get-go um, so that the audience know Actually, mm -hmm. you know, you have a particular bias or you have a particular representation. Are you mean in relation to the media? Yeah, in the media. Um, yep. Narelda? Guess, well, I guess, yeah, yeah there, there, there's been some occasions where we've gone to mining sites, you know, and, and we've been flown up by the company and we will declare that, mm. you know, we, we, were, we were a guest of, you know, Rio Tinto or we were a guest of Hancock Prospecting or something like that, you know. But at the end of the day, it doesn't, it, the story's been independent. You know, we, we haven't you know, written the story and got the mining company to check it and say yes, you know, or no, you've got to take that out. You've got it's got to be complementary to to our, our, our core business or whatever. So mm. so we have a level of independence, but um, we, we you know, I think we all good journalism it. does have yeah. that. I I wonder if you're blurring the lines between opinion and news, yeah. and that blurring has been massively problematic. Opinion belongs under a big heading called opinion, mm. not on the front page under the word news. Uh, and that blurring, I think, has been problematic. I, I would argue and with Narelda that all good journalism yes. has at its core that integrity and, and disclaimer. It, it doesn't happen very often because we've got to pay our way. You know, I, it doesn't, mm. yeah. I think with journalism and politics, it should just be always disclose, disclose, disclose. Mm. Mm. Gentlemen with the glasses there, black shirt, I think. My name is Daniel Harvey. Uh, loving the discussion, thank you. Um, my question is around this idea of idiotus. Um, <laughs> and it's a great word, And, isn't and it? our new love, bumper sticker. I love the word. Yep. Um, we're in a situation where families have higher levels of debt, more jobs, casualisation of work, less time, mm, mm. higher stress. How do you think that those type of facts or trends in our society influence this idea of participation in democracy and yeah. the development of idiotis, if you Great will? Great question. Jeff? Well, well I, I, there, there's no doubt that I think we need uh, participation of people, more participation of our people in the politics. The question is, what are, what's the institution that's going to allow for that to produce good results. And, and you know, the gatekeeper question can't be avoided. What's the best way to go from majority opinion to the public interest? And you know, I think we need good institutions to allow that link to be made. Uh, and so I, I, I favour more deliberation, and more random selection to add to our current representative right. system to get a balance into it. Such a good question, because I, I, it's sad, it's hard, and I'm sure Narelda mm. is the same as me and Jess, that some weekends we just have to unplug mm. because it's, it's tough. And so what is our right to be uninformed and, and, and be happy? And that, that, that classic phrase of, you know, my desire to stay, stay sane is fundamentally at my odds with my desire to stay informed. I would say that we've used up right now our right to be uninformed, uh, that, that I can see an end date on democracy and that scares the hell out of me. And so we now have a civic responsibility to tap back in. And if we do it right, maybe we can find those ways to tap back out again. We've only got a few minutes left. I think there's a lady in there with a the mic already. Yeah, have I got someone in there with a the mic? No, not at this stage. Okay, we'll go down to the lady with the, you've got the mic. Yes, you go thank for you. it. Thank you, Mandy McAvoy is my name and thanks for a really engaging panel discussion. Um, Jess, you touched on it towards the end. Narelda, you did too, about inquiring minds and, and critical thinking. And the lady behind me prompted the question about youth. How important would it be for us to be teaching critical thinking yeah. in our schools, in our primary and high schools? Every, yeah. In, in fact, as I understand it, uh, in the curriculum here in Western Australia, there is philosophy, uh, a program, because I know about this, because in New South Wales, they're looking at it, and some of my friends here in the curriculum side in WA have gone over to speak to them. And it, critical thinking is very much part of that curriculum. Mm. Mm. Humanities is very undervalued. Can I, can I offer a solution that Jess was talking about earlier? Um, teach journalism in schools. Teach it properly. 
teach the relationship between journalism and democracy. I'm still fighting within journalism education what I do, that journalism is knowledge and not just a skill. There are lots of people who think journalism is a trade, and I'm arguing that there are absolutely skills that can and should be taught, but if you miss the knowledge, and if you teach journalism, you kind of learn a little bit about everything, because that's the beauty of journalism. You learn philosophy, history, psychology, sociology, anthropology, politics, economics. Teach it in schools. Mm. Teach it right. That's a good point. And uh, short of having any education, formal education uh, around it, teach your kids how to be critical thinkers. <laughs> For goodness <laughs> sakes, teach your kids to be discerning about Correct. what they're reading. That's, it, this, they're on the screens all the time. So talk mm. to them about what, it, what did you just see? Is that true? Why not? Jess felt that one. Can you tell that <laughs> Jess felt that one? Um, <laughs> we've got a lady there in a red jumper, I think, hand up. Yep, great, fantastic. She's coming behind you, brilliant. Oh, okay, Hello. yep, you can be Hello. very generous and hand it on. <laughs> My name's Anne McCrudden. I just wanted to, when we leave here, a message that we could take forth that we could put on a bumper sticker <laughs> or a T-shirt. What could we say about we want the truth? Well, maybe we could all just uh, come up with a, an individual bump, bumper, bumper sticker. We've got yours already, Glyn. We've got yours. Mine would be teach your kids to be critical thinkers <laughs> and it'll spread across the entire bumper. I don't have kids. So. <laughs> teach Narelda? other people's kids. Uh, I'm trying to think of something clever. I can't, I can't well, think of anything. I, can't, I, can just, I just remember the Geraldton Senior High School, the Seeker Fines. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. We've just got to work out how the ABC is going to fund these bumper stickers, but I can see my boss <laughs> down here in the left-hand corner, so we've got that sorted. We'll take a collection we, tin we, outside. We, we really only have a few minutes left, so please, if you've got a question, Quick, throw your hand up so at least I can see. I am lucky I've got my contact lenses in. We'll come back. Look, I feel Behind sorry you. for the people down the back. Can we have one mic head to the back? Behind and you. one mic head this to the front. This person down here. If Where's one of you heads to the back, right and one in front to of you, buddy. Yep. There you go. Tap him on the shoulder. There. Yes, young man. No, yeah. It's We're going to be generous. This, this gentleman. Is it microphone? There you go. Oh, thank you. John McBain, um, member of Labor Party policy committees and the journalist union and uh, hopefully a critical thinker. The, uh, I want to go to the issue of truth and what is it? And the most we've heard said about that today is evidence base. And I put it to the panel that evidence is um, often a perspective too. So in this world, we've got seven billion or whatever different perspectives. They're all valid, but not necessarily right. And the context of those discussions could be in comparing, say, the history of Israel, Aboriginal people in this country, or the fate that are what awaits a great Australian, Julian Assange. Um, you're entitled to your own opinions, not entitled to your own facts. That's part one. Part two is when we teach journalism, we teach it as a, as a method of objectivity. Objectivity in its simplest terms is to remove all the bias and if somebody else was to use, if Norelda used the same source material as me, would she come to the same conclusion? If that's your method, then you're being objective and that's the best we can do at the moment. Final question. Wait. Luck come in, spinner. Down the back there. Yep, that's right. Can't that, see. I've got no chance of seeing you. should do auctions or like horse yeah, racing sorry, or blind as. Come in around the corner, around one. Far one, away. One, two, one, <laughs> Uh, thanks, oh. guys. It's uh, Mark Tilly here. Uh, I'm just curious about your comments about integrity and leadership, because the institutions that we generally used to look to as leadership roles to sort of guide us in sort of our, uh, where morally and socially we want the country to progress to, that isn't exactly happening anymore because of this sort of individualization and vested interests and political gain and manipulation and all the rest. So I was just wondering what, if we can't look to those institutions anymore for moral or just, civic can leadership. Say, can I just say, how do we know we can't look? Because we have read about them in newspapers. <laughs> we've seen it on the TV news yeah. and we've heard it on the radio. Media in this country are keeping those uh, heads of uh, corporations to account and that is why we need journalists to investigate and to get to the truth and to be present at royal commissions the banking royal commission royal commission into in institutional child abuse um mm. the in, uh, uh, royal commission into um elder abuse you know that's why we need the coverage of these inquiries and inquests um in the courtrooms 
in uh, um, uh, Parliament House, uh, all over. We, that's why we need journos there to cover it and to tell us what we need to know and to uncover corruption. Journalists are still busting a gut to keep the bastards honest. That democracy has degraded in line with journalism is not a coincidence. So fix one and I think inevitably you fix the other, but it does require a lot of your input onto that. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up there, folks. My big thanks to Dr. Jeff Gallup, former WA Premier, Glyn Greensmith, journalism lecturer, and Narada Jacobs, Ken Newsletter. Before you take off, thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Coming up next in the Discovery Lounge, Sheila uh, Magadza, James Jegasothi, Marilyn Mehta, telling the migrant story. If you get a chance, Bree Lee will be doing a book signing now in the Library Theatre foyer. And also you can check out the virtual Woodjuck in the Nook. I think it's here to my left. It's a 10 minute virtual reality experience taking you back to Woodjuck land before European settlement. And we'll be starting back here at 1.45pm with the telling of that migrant story. Thanks again. <laughs>